Okay, hi everyone. This is Dan Barry with uh, the Climate Program Office MAP Program. Um, and thanks for joining this webinar today. It's been a little while since we did a MAP webinar, but this is part of our, of our series. And it um, should be a really interesting webinar, a very timely topic. Um, so we're going to hear from six speakers today, and I'm going to give just a little introduction to the uh, background on this particular topic and the involvement of the MAP program with this topic, and then we'll get into some talks. Um, at the outset, I'd like to just mention that uh, you might see that there's a poll up on your screen right now. Uh, I see some people have already taken the poll, uh, so thanks for doing that, uh, but we still have a, a large portion of the audience that has not yet. Um, we're going to do a few polls during this webinar. Uh, it's something we haven't done too much in the past on webinars, but there were a few interesting questions that we thought up to kind of stimulate um, some sort of general thinking about this topic as we go along with the webinar. If we have time at the end, we'll maybe even ask some of the speakers to react to the results of the poll. Um, so I think that'll be pretty interesting. Um, but basically this topic, uh, you know, this office, Climate Program Office, we have a really rich history of supporting broad climate research efforts. Um, so things like interactions between components of the physical climate system as well as support for the overall research and development enterprise in climate. Things like putting buoys in the water, which the Ocean Observations Division does, to model development, which a number of programs here do, uh, to stakeholder engagement and climate assessment. On the seasonal prediction side, that's a, primarily a climate research problem, so it requires approaches and technologies that have been pursued by the climate research community over the past few decades. Things like coupled and earth system models, statistical methodologies and approaches, and um, understanding of ocean land atmosphere interactions, uh, insights that are gained from process and field studies, and extensive monitoring efforts uh, to monitor the, the state of the climate system. On the shorter timescales, the so sub-seasonal timescales, which is what we're focused on with this webinar, um, we're talking about uh, timescales basically from week two to six, although there might be some other you know, opinions about what constitutes the sub-seasonal timescale. Uh, but we're looking between explicit weather prediction or forecasting and, and the seasonal or climate prediction timescales. And um, this time scale offers a rich set of new research questions and an opportunity for communities from both the weather forecasting side and the climate uh, prediction side uh, to apply knowledge and capabilities to, to attack the overall problem. So our program was motivated a few years ago by um, scientific interest in this area and also operational needs at NOAA and, and other federal agencies. And we started investing in research and transition activities via the climate testbed a few years ago uh, with the goal of making progress in this area, both from a scientific perspective but also from a capabilities perspective, so advancing operational prediction. Uh, you're going to hear a variety of, of elements of this today. We're going to hear about the subseasonal to seasonal task force, which is organized by the MAP program. Uh, Libby Barnes is the lead of that task force. And that's a, a major scientist-led effort to advance understanding of S2S predictability, um, examine some of the, the modeling systems that are commonly used to do forecasts at this time scale, and uh, to provide a foundation for improved subseasonal to seasonal prediction. You're going to hear from Ben Kurtman about the subseasonal experiment, which is a major new effort that our program fostered, but um, it, it relies on significant contributions from other federal agencies and the National Weather Service and GGPS program as well. And um, it's a really interesting experiment where um, folks from the academic side are, are working with federal laboratories and operational centers, and it's a really uh, rich activity um, that both gets at research and operational questions. And we're also going to hear some broad perspectives. Uh, we have Mike Ventrice from the Weather Company. He's going to talk a bit about some of the subseasonal work that they're doing there. And uh, we're going to hear from uh, Paolo uh, Ruti and, and Mitch Rickson, who are both with the World Meteorological Organization. And they're going to talk about uh, the subseasonal to seasonal international experiment from both the climate and the uh, weather perspective um, that they work on as part of WMO. So um, in closing, the, this set of research activities that you're going to hear about connects NOAA with the external community, and it advances NOAA science and capabilities. From this office's perspective, from the Climate Program Office perspective, uh, the work you're going to hear about is a piece in the larger puzzle of what we do in this office, where we apply science to societally important issues. Um, 
we focus on a variety of timescales, including centennial timescales and CPO and in the MAP program. And, um, and the, the expression of climate change is, of course, really relevant at subseasonal and seasonal timescales, especially when you get to issues of societal uh, preparedness and adaptation. Um, many of the impacts play out on weather, subseasonal and seasonal timescales. And so we feel that the investment in this area is a big piece of advancing the overall resilience of society in the United States and to provide the nation with the best possible information and products that's informed by science. Um, so we're going to start out with Libby Barnes, and uh, the poll has closed. It has a five-minute time limit. I'm going to be putting polls up between the speakers, so they'll probably overlap a, a little bit with the beginning of, of each of the talks. Um, and, and again, as I said at the beginning, if we have time at the end, it'll be great to take a look at what the results of the polls are. Um, so Libby, are you there? <clears throat> yeah, I'm here, Dan. Can you hear me? Yeah, sounds good. I just passed control over to your computer. <clears throat> All right, are we, are we on? Looks good, yeah, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, great. So thank you so much for giving me the, the opportunity to tell you a little bit about NOMAP's SOS Prediction Task Force. Um, and I'm really going to talk about this idea of bridging the gap between weather forecasts and sort of seasonal forecasting. And, and I'm here as a representative representing the task force, um, and I'll tell you more about that as we go. But first, what, what is this gap? What are we talking about? And, and I think I like to start typically with this idea of chaos. And so a lot of people know of this as the butterfly effect. So it was made famous in 1972 with this idea from Ed Lorenz that when the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil sets off a tornado in Texas. Said another way, it's this idea that really small differences in initial positions may lead to enormous differences in some final phenomena. And so this idea is, you know, does prediction become impossible? And so when we think about weather events and weather um, forecasting in terms of this butterfly effect, you can think about a plot that looks something like this, where we have the ability to predict being shown here um, in the vertical. And when we think about weather, after about two weeks, this butterfly effect or this, this, the chaotic nature of the atmosphere really typically kicks in. And on longer time scales, so seasonal outlooks, for example, um, where we can really use the memory of the ocean to understand, you know, will next season be hotter or colder, um, et cetera, you know, that's when we can use these lower, um, the, these slower variations in, in the Earth's climate. But it's really in the middle between these two that we have what we call the sub-seasonal to seasonal time scale. So Dan said two weeks to six weeks. I tend to think, you know, a, a few weeks to, to two or three months here. Um, and the, so the question is, how do we make forecasts of, of relevant weather and, and say, um, extreme weather on these, on these time scales? And so really this task force um, that, that I'm a part of is, is working to bridge this gap and try and find a way to make predictions um, on, on this two week to two month time frame. Now you might wonder why do I care about this time frame? Well, if you think about weather events here in green on the left, I think you can think about, you know, hurricane evacuations are issued, you know, you know a day or, or two beforehand. Or we can think about severe weather alerts um, from the National Weather Service. Um, and on the far right, so thinking seasonally, we are thinking about, you know, trading of futures in the stock market or navigating the Arctic. Um, where will the ice be on seasonal timescales? But it's really these, the sub-seasonal timescale where a lot of decisions are being made. And I believe we're going to hear more about that later today. Um, but for example, where um, uh, reservoir managers have to decide whether to let the water out of their reservoirs or not, where the agricultural sector is deciding should we plant our seeds or should we wait a few more weeks, um, where uh, emergency planners would really like to get all their supplies in the general area um, so that they're ready when disaster strikes. Um, so in that sense, you know, the subseasonal time scale is, is really a critical time scale if we can make, make bridge this gap and make these forecasts. Um, and so that leads us to this, the MAP S2S, again, subseasonal to seasonal prediction task force. I'm the lead, but I have um, four other wonderful co-leads who I have their faces up up here, but this, this task force is really not about us. This task force is currently 59 plus. I put the plus because um, I believe it's grown even more since I got that number. 
scientists from all over all over the globe, um, and and we're all really working together to to try and bridge this gap in prediction skill um, and products between these traditional weather and seasonal lead times. And this particular task force is really made up of 14 projects, and I'll talk a bit about them, plus the SubX project, which Ben Kurtman at the end of this webinar will be telling you quite a bit more about. Um, and so what do we do? What is, this, what is a task force? It sounds pretty, pretty intense. Um, and, and what we do is, I, I like to think of it as we're connecting scientists all over the globe. We hold monthly teleconferences. Um, most of the work is conducted remotely, but it's really about facilitating collaboration between all of these projects and groups. Rather than every, having everybody work sort of in silos alone, it's about sharing data sets, methodology, methodologies, results, and tying in with other S2S projects like the International um, S2S Project, which we'll hear about more today. Um, our, in terms of products, uh, producing reports, review articles, and special journal uh, collections and journals, and I believe Dan mentioned, but we're supported mainly through the MAP um, FY16 research competition. And the idea of this task force, again, is that the MAP program is really facilitating our activities um, but with the, the leads and the task force as a whole, sort of steering what, what we're doing and, and how to advance this field. All right, so thinking a bit more about the actual science here. So the argument here is to bridge this S2S gap for extreme weather prediction, we really have to understand processes on longer timescales than just weather. Um, and this is, again, because of this butterfly effect. So I'm gonna show this schematic um, in a few different ways, but I, what I really wanna show here is this idea of extreme weather like heat waves, um, atmospheric rivers, which bring a lot of water to the west coast of the US. I'll tell you more about those in a few minutes. Extratropical cyclones dump a lot of snow, wind, rain on the east coast of the US and in the middle, and of course, um, hurricanes and tropical cyclones. To really understand these processes and bridge this gap in terms of their forecasting, we need these longer times climate time scale type um, processes. For example, the El Nino, other, El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, is really critical um, for predicting some of these, these extreme weather events. Another type of phenomenon called the MJO, or the Madden Julian Oscillation, which is a, a bunch of clouds and rain pretty much in, in, uh, along the equator that starts in the Indian Ocean and propagates eastward, can also be important for predicting these extreme weather events. And so what our task force does is, I'm gonna put up a, a slide here. It looks like an absolute mess, but what it's showing you is all of the different pieces of the puzzle that this task force is, is putting to, uh, together to try to predict extreme weather events. Um, so you can see at the top here, thoughts about the stratospheric polar vortex. How, how does that play a role in, in helping us um, predict extreme weather at subseasonal time scales. Um, we also have the role of the ocean and how sea surface temperature variability and the coupling between the ocean surface and the atmosphere interact to give us this information on this two week to two month time scale, as well as lots of other things going on. Um, in, in addition, there's to the physical processes side, which are really shown on this on this global picture, we also have people in the task force working on model resolution and the model physics. Um, how do we best set up our model forecast system to make predictions on these time scales? Um, how do we leverage different models together, which is something SubX has been doing, um, to make these predictions? And then also what kinds of products um, are necessary at these time scales and how do we assess you know, skill and predictability? So there's really a lot going on in this task force um, related to S2S um, and many different direct, uh, uh, key directions to take. And so last year, the task force, one of the first things we did was put together a list of what we thought were sort of key questions for the S2S problem. And we divided them into three parts, processes and physics, approaches to S2S prediction, and then really evaluating and improving models, our dynamical models for S2S prediction. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but I wanna highlight just three here because I'm gonna give a few examples of how these are being addressed in the task force right now. Um, the first is 
in terms of processes in physics, how do tropical and extratropical or stratosphere and troposphere connections influence S to S prediction? Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Another one in terms of approaches is how can we really transition seamlessly from this idea of forecasting a weather problem or a, a weather event on a few days to really going into the subseasonal time scale, you know, two weeks to two months? Um, and how do we make this seamless transition? And then finally, in terms of evaluating and improving models, an example question might be, how well do models represent some of the important interactions between, say, the tropics and the extratropics, or the troposphere and the strat stratosphere, um, or the ocean and the land, uh, sorry, ocean and atmosphere, land and atmosphere. And so I, I want to give you just a brief one slide outlook of, of, of some of the projects that are addressing these questions. So the first one here is um, some work, ongoing work by Paul Dermeyer at George Mason and Trent Ford at Southern Illinois University, trying to understand the importance of land surface memory, so the memory in the land itself, in driving um, heat waves and drought. And can we use this information in the land to actually predict heat waves and drought um, at subseasonal time scales? And so um, the idea here is we talked a little bit about that butterfly effect. Um, and at long time scales, the ocean gives us um, information about what's happening. And at really short time scales, we can really use the weather. That butterfly effect hasn't kicked in yet. And so we can really use the atmospheric conditions to understand the weather. But it's between those two, between about seven days and 30 days, that memory in the land has been shown to be very important. And one of the, the goals of, of, of this project is not just to understand the importance of the land, but also to try and determine how to do the seamless forecasting from forecast leads of just a few days to much longer into the subseasonal time scale. And so one of the things that these groups have developed is a particular weighting scheme, which is shown here um, in terms of Poisson weights, to try and uh, allow your, what you're trying to forecast in terms of, say, extreme heat or maximum temperature over a larger and larger range of, of, of days as you move out into the subseasonal time scale, again, trying to approach the seamless um, prediction. And on the top, the maps, what you see are the, um, the duration of skill, so how long the model, the NCEP CFS version 2, has skill using on the left-hand side um, this deterministic validation, and on the right-hand side using this seamless Poisson um, validation technique. And what you can see on the right here is that you can get um, skill out to 21 days here, so well into the subseasonal range in predicting extreme heat. All right, so another example is, I, I, is in terms of the stratosphere um, and the role of the stratosphere and how well models, so many models do not have well-resolved stratospheres, is this important for subseasonal prediction? And so we have some, a group um, at NOAA and NCAR working on this, Judith Prolitz and Hyaga Richter and Lantau Sun. And what they've done is they've taken the CESM1, so the NCAR um, climate model here, which typically has a, only 30 levels in it. So this is considered low top, so not a terribly well-resolved stratosphere. And they've made it 46 levels. So now it can resolve the stratosphere. And the question is, does improving the stratosphere actually improve forecasts at subseasonal time ranges. And what they find is, in fact, yes, um, if you look four weeks out, the predictability of the stratosphere, as shown by the quasi-biennial oscillation, is shown in the upper right panel. Um, so we have improved predictability when we increase the resolution, the vertical resolution in the model. And on the bottom, if you say, well, maybe, you know, maybe I don't care so much what's going on in the stratosphere, what about the surface? If you look at the surface circulation, um, say wintertime surface circulation, and you look at how well um, does it correlate with what was actually observed, the, the improved res vertical resolution in the model actually provides improved um, forecasts out to 28 to about 40 days. So again, showing that, that the representation of the stratosphere in models is important for these subseasonal um, to seasonal prediction problems. And again, we'll talk more about SubX later, but they ran these, these, these simulations using the SubX protocol 
and the data is has been submitted to IRI, um, meaning that the, the data is available for researchers um, to, to play with and, and do their own experiments. Um, and finally, I want to talk about looking at how these teleconnections between different regions, so in terms of processes, may be important for predicting um, extreme weather events in the United States. So in this case, this is work that is being done with my group and Eric Maloney um, here at Colorado State University. And the idea is seeing if we can predict atmospheric rivers or extreme rainfall using knowledge of the physical processes, for example, this Madden-Julian oscillation in the tropics, um, as well as what's going on in the stratosphere. So a little motivation here is, you know, atmospheric rivers, many people nowadays have heard of these in the context of California. About a year ago, there was the Orville Dam spillway that um, ended up having a, a lot of damage done to it due to um, multiple atmospheric rivers hitting the region over a few week time scale. But I think it's important to note that atmospheric rivers bring a lot of water to regions other than California. For example, in Alaska, there was a landslide in 2014 caused by an atmospheric river. And in the Midwest, there was flooding in 1993 that has been attributed to many atmospheric rivers sort of pummeling the region. So these, these, these features bring lots of moisture to the U.S. where they dump a lot of rain. And the question is, can we predict them um, more than just a few days out? And what my group is doing here is trying to use the Madden-Julian oscillation or the MJO as a source of predictability. And what the MJO is, is a region of rainy and dry areas. So in this picture here, the dry is brown and the greens are clouds and rain. And the idea is this, this tropical um, signal propagates to the east, and so I'll click forward here, propagates to the east and changes what's going on in mid-latitudes where we live. And it actually diverts the storm track, which can then change where these atmospheric rivers go, um, potentially bringing flooding rain um, and wind to different regions, depending on what this tropical um, convection is doing. And it does this through, um, I've overlaid here, this Rossby wave teleconnection pattern, which links what's going on in the tropics to what's going on where we live. You can sort of think of this as dropping a rock in a pond, and that makes a, a ripple effect, and the ripples then propagate away and affect um, up the pond elsewhere. So we've been looking at whether we can use information about this phenomenon, this tropical phenomenon, to predict atmospheric rivers, but we also found that there was another important tropical phenomenon, which was the quasi-biennial oscillation, or the QBO. And this is um, an, an oscillation that's associated with the stratospheric winds, and it tells us whether the winds in the stratosphere are moving to the east or whether they're moving to the west. And this movement of air in the stratosphere can impact what the MJO and the tropics and what that, those clouds are doing. And if you remember, I showed you um, previously that there are other groups in the task force working on um, the predictability of the QBO itself and the importance of model vertical resolution. So this is a way that it, within this task force, we really have groups working sort of synergistically and talking to, to try and make the most out of each of our projects. So taking these two bits of information, what can we say about atmospheric rivers? And in my final slides here, I want to talk a little bit about the, the actual results because I'm really excited about them. Um, and one of our goals was to predict atmospheric rivers, in this case, let's say, over the Pacific Northwest as an example. Um, and on the left-hand side is a plot where the, where the MJO convection is, so where, where that rainy area is, is shown on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is lead time, so time from that day, you know, looking forward into the future. Um, and what we see, first of all, is this big, if you look in the top, this big yellow stripe moving down the plot. And what that show, is showing us is where we have increased atmospheric river activity over the Pacific Northwest. So that black box denotes the fact that if today the MJO is in what we call phase five, then about three weeks from now we should expect increased atmospheric river activity over the Pacific Northwest. Now the bottom plot is the same type of plot, but in that same black region, it's blue. And what that means 
is during MJO phase five, about three weeks from now, we expect decreased atmospheric river activity. And the difference between these two panels is what's going on in the stratosphere, whether those stratospheric winds or that QBO has winds from the east or winds from the west. And my little maps here with the red arrows are showing you two different scenarios where we had atmospheric river activity um, about three weeks following MJO phase five in each of these different stratospheric regimes. Now that's all nice and good, but what does this tell us about actually predicting atmospheric rivers? Um, and this is where some recent work that was, just came out in this last month um, from a group where we show that actually if you make the same type of plot, but now the colors denote the actual prediction skill, here we've denoted it by the Heidke skill score, using only knowledge of what the QBO or the stratospheric winds are doing and what the MJO is doing, we actually see skill, once again, propagating um, to show that the propagation of the MJO and showing us that we have skill in predicting atmospheric river activity well out um, to, you know, 30 plus days ahead based on knowledge of the MJO and QBO. And I want to remind you here that this butterfly effect that we're talking about for atmospheric rivers and extreme weather all alone would, would expect the skill to end around 14 days. And the point is we see skill well beyond that, that two-week time scale. Again, just using the, the knowledge of the physical processes of these sort of longer time scale processes going on in the tropics. And just as a, as a brief comparison to show you, if we try to predict atmospheric river activity using the ECMWF, so the European's dynamical model, we really see this fall off of skill um, after about two weeks, as expected from the butterfly effect. Um, so what this is saying is, you know, there's, I, I find this very motivating, actually. It's saying that there's information in our atmosphere that we still, you know, we still need to learn how to take advantage of. All right, so with those three examples, I want to just point out once again that the NOAA MAPS S2S Prediction Task Force, we're working on many, many different facets of the S2S prediction problem, both in terms of processes, in um, approaches and, and model setups, to what kinds of products are useful and how do we assess skill in the first place or deal with this bridging the gap and this seamless prediction from weather to seasonal outlooks. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the rest of the talks. Great, thanks a lot, Libby. <clears throat> I think um, we might have time for perhaps one question uh, for you. So if you're logged in on the webinar, um, the way to pose a question is you can send me a chat message and tell me you have a question or you can type your question in. Um, I'm happy to unmute your line. Just let me know that you have a question. Um, you can also, I think, um, in the Q&A area indicate that you have a, a question as well and just signal that to me. Um, Libby, in, in the meantime, I'm going to, I think, open the, the next poll. I think you set this one up nicely, so um, I'll open it up now. And basically, it's just looking at um, predictability sources and, and which predictability sources people think are uh, most underexploited. And you went through pretty much all of these in your presentation. So we ask uh, folks on the webinar just to select which one you think um, is, is perhaps uh, has the greatest amount of untapped predictability or it's currently underexploited um, in the meantime. And uh, if you can multitask, you can also let me know by the chat feature if you have a question for Libby. If you have a question but you're not able to get it in too quickly, we can also go back to Libby a little bit later. So feel free to um, keep, you know, keep typing your question in or letting me know. It's okay, we can, we can come back to Libby later. So Libby, I haven't seen anything yet, uh, so I think we'll move on to the next speaker, but that was a, a great orientation, and, uh, and thanks for leading off. Sure thing. Sure thing. Let me just stop sharing here. Sure. So, uh, Paolo and Mitch, are you on the line? Yes, we are. Yes. Great. Okay, Paolo, I'm going to transfer control over to your computer, and... Okay, you should have control now. So if you could go to the Quick Start tab and share your screen with us, that would be great. Thank you. 
And apologies if you guys can hear noise in the background here. It sounds like they're lifting the entire building at the moment. I don't know exactly what's happening. But... Okay. <laughs> sure, maybe, or they're deconstructing it, I don't know. Um, so, Paolo, uh, I think you're going to lead off first, So, and you and Mitch are going to uh, go back and forth. So whenever you're ready, it looks like the slides are up on the screen. Please go ahead. Okay, I, okay, I... I shared the screen, so I, I'm ready. I can start. Right. Yes, please. Okay, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, hi, I'm Mitch. We will provide uh, an, an, uh, an international coordination perspective uh, on what is, about, uh, what is around this sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction project. But let first, uh, let us thank the, the, the two co-chairs of this, uh, of this uh, in, in international uh, WMO uh, and WCRP projects. So uh, Frederic Vitar from ECNWF and, and uh, Andy Robertson that is, uh, is part of this, uh, of this webinar. I think it's, uh, it's thanks to their effort and to the, all the steering group that this project is, uh, is really successful and, and working and going further. So I would immediately start to give you a perspective because that was one of the questions uh, uh, be, uh, behind this, uh, this webinar. So what is happening in terms of the two communities, so the weather and climate communities, even if we can question the, this distinction, but why now we are working closely together on this perspective? And let me start with a very short uh, in introduction to, to an, giving an historical background. So, and we start far, far away from, from the, just after the Second World War when WMO has been and be started to has been um, created uh, uh, just after the the Second World War, and the first large uh, um, program of WMO has been the World Weather Watch. And under the World Weather Watch, that was '63, there has been started the Global Atmosphere Research Program, and this is really important because developed uh, a large series of field campaign and uh, developing the let's say the the uh, modeling uh, infrastructure that nowadays we consider operational that uh, has been developed uh, thanks also to the large contribution of the science that has been has been uh, uh, produced under the, the the GARP or the GARP program. Then historically what happened that there's been of course a strong focus on the climate, on the climate issue and, and WMO initially with the X and then uh, Later on, IOC joined, developed uh, so this co-sponsored program that is the World Climate Research Program, and, uh, and at the same time, there's been the, the development of another important working group that is the Working Group on Numerical Experimentation, because this one is bringing together all the research and operational components of the big uh, global centers around, around the world. So what happened that historically that is interesting that the the, the weather program is is most is is younger and is being developed only in 1998. So if you look, there is a big gap between the the GARP and the World Weather Research Program. And then historically, it's interesting to know that has been developed probably because of the U.S. Uh, weather research program that influenced the decision of the WMO Congress. And, and then under the World Weather Research Program, the TORPEX project that established this, uh, let's say, contributed to the establishment of this uh, uh, ensemble prediction uh, framework. And then this, in 2013, the subseasonal to seasonal prediction project and the polar prediction project has been uh, approved by, by WMO and started working. And in 2014, there's been the, the, open, the first World Weather Open Science Conference. And, and last but not least, the High Impact Weather Project, which is one other project dedicated to, to uh, very high resolution issues related to a set of natural hazards. But why this long, uh, this, let's say, this, uh, this uh, time, this historical background, because I think there's also an historical value of a subseasonal to seasonal projects that is bringing together the, the two communities working together at the right time. 
and this is because now uh, so this interesting historical perspective bringing to this to this discussion but let's now move quickly to what uh, at the moment so at the present uh, uh, the world weather research program is doing is is fostering research cooperative research to improve weather and environmental prediction services from minutes to months so this is our let's say kind of uh, of a short statement and of course we are looking to 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 how the, the science and the knowledge can be developed across all the value chain of the weather prediction system so from observation down to uh, impact modeling and to the decision making process so we have also a strong social component in, embedded and we are trying to strengthen the the interaction between the academic world and the operational uh, world so creating this partnership around the world and with a strong uh, effort in, in uh, uh, supporting the role of early career scientists. So this is just to, to briefly explain uh, what the World Weather Program is, 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 uh, is in, in a nutshell. What uh, is important and what I would try to answer in the, in the next few slides and where we see, let's say, important uh, elements at the interface between uh, between weather and, and climate. First of all, few key achievements, as, as I already mentioned, the, the, the TORPEX, so the ensemble prediction has been certainly one important aspect, and also on, the, on, 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 other, on other sectors is becoming more and more used, and we moved from deterministic to, to a probabilistic approach, also thanks to a lot of research behind the, the, the TORPEX uh, initiatives. But other important contribution have been a series of, uh, of uh, dedicated regional uh, projects uh, uh, that they are bringing together research and observation and field campaign components. I'm quoting here just the mesoscale alpine program, but a lot of uh, Olympic games, uh, and you know that the, the actual Olympic games in uh, in, uh, in South uh, Korea, there's been a, a lot of uh, investment in observations and, and prediction from the research perspective. So let me just move to the, to the key questions we believe are important because they are at the interface between weather, climate, and the environment. First of all, I think, is understanding the multi-scale interaction between high-impact weather events and the environment in which they, they develop. Uh, I think uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, shown how the, the looking to the uh, atmospheric river, there's a, a clear evidence that we are breaking the, 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 20, the 14 days uh, uh, war. I think most, there's, there's a lot of, of research that needs to be, to be developed, but certainly the, the, the multi-scale interaction uh, is, is one component that we need to look how this could influence the predictability into the system. Then as we are discussing, the subseasonal scale is a, is a natural frontier between the weather science and the climate science. Uh, and the other important area is when we move to regional circulation systems. So monsoon, tropical cyclones, how we can interpret them in both the the weather context and the climate context and how could improve the decision-making uh, process in, at, at the regional scale. I think this is another area where the two communities are, are I mean, the effort from the two communities is extremely important. And, and moving towards increasing predictive skill for both weather and climate, I think this development of air, air system perspective that now is seamless is the, the polar prediction project is working on a on a couple data simulation and on uh, on uh, on in, on using couple system for short range forecast in the in the polar regions and so and the the climate community is extremely engaged because there's a strong interest to understand the short uh, short range pro, short short time processes in the coupling between the ocean the ice and the atmosphere that can be used to improve climate models as well. 
So if we can just briefly detail some of those uh, uh, elements of, at the frontier, I think advancing modeling observation is one area where there's a, there's a, a, a joint effort and how to define future of service system that must consider the needs for weather, climate, and environment is certainly a tricky point. We see this more and more important in the polar regions area, but that is again important at the tropical level. Uh, what could be, for instance, the best observational network for in improving the subseasonal prediction and how we improve MJO? MJO certainly at the is at the, at the center of this, of this discussion. Another area is the high performing computing and how to handle this massive amount of data. And this is a, a major challenge in the future for both communities. And there are a lot of effort going on and linking this with, the, with other research communities such as uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, research. And I'm picking up other few elements before leaving the, the space to, to, to meet. Is we need, of course, to, to strengthen the, our regional activities. And this is because most of the societal impacts depend crucially on, on how we will be able to, to develop regional, better regional information. And this is one area where certainly both, the, the both programs have a strong interest and how we prepare to the future. So how we can uh, develop uh, joint uh, infrastructures and, and, and capacity, uh, and capacity uh, building uh, uh, activities. And how we can, and we are already working together in su sustaining and supporting the early career scientist community. And, and this is, those are uh, key elements that are at the frontier between the, the communities and that we are strongly working together to, to, to be successful. And I leave now space to, to, to Mitch for a few slides and we will run as Lalo. Thank you, Paolo, and uh, hello everyone. And thank you also uh, to Libby for uh, nicely setting the scene uh, with those uh, really excellent uh, considerations. And thanks, Paolo, for uh, being, giving the broad perspective uh, from uh, from the, on the international research agenda. Uh, so uh, I have a few slides first uh, on WCRP uh, to make the parallel with what the Paolo just presented regarding WWRP and some of the joint efforts that we have had in the past and also more recently. So our uh, mission for the World Climate Research Program is to facilitate analysis and prediction of the Earth system. And so you see here that prediction is really built in into our mandate and also earth system and hence earth system modeling. Of course, uh, we cover two mainstreams. The first one is variability, the second one is change. And so we have those two overarching objectives. The first one being to determine the predictability of the climate. So this really connects us to the, the whole uh, prediction problem from subseason to decadal predictions. And the other one is to determine the effect of human activities on climate. So this is more linking uh, our research efforts to the policy side, you know, like IPCC and so forth. Uh, I would like also to stress uh, a somewhat different nature uh, of WC WCRP compared to uh, the World Weather Research Program in the sense that our program, our climate research program, is a co-sponsored program. So WMO, of course, is a, a very important partner for us, but we have also involvement of uh, IOC, so the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and ICSU. And that uh, also uh, nicely hints to the fact that uh, the ocean is important for us and, and that uh, plays a, a major role also in, in our prediction business. And ICSU, as the, the other uh, third sponsor, also helps us connecting with the academic world and the you know, universities, research centers. It's not just limited to do, strictly speaking, to the, the NWP centers. So in a way, uh, that has uh, offered the program a, a tremendous, um, you know, uh, um, ability to, to draw the energy from a, a wide, wide uh, and diverse community. Um, 
Next slide, please, uh, Paolo. We can move to the next one. Okay. Uh, so uh, you are probably probably familiar with some of the the main activities within WCRP. Uh, for example, the Copper Model Comparison Project and Cordex and so forth. And we, for those projects which are ma making major contributions to IPCC, and they use well, initially they were using coupled ocean atmosphere models, and then gradually incorporating more and more processes into uh, Earth system models. Uh, we have also the prediction counterpart, and we had uh, some uh, substantial uh, activities for a number of uh, many, many years, actually, under the working group on seasonal to, uh, well, sub-seasonal to uh, interdecadal predictions. And uh, also people like uh, Ben Kernan, for example, were quite instrumental in, in, in driving those efforts. Uh, one effort which is somewhat similar to the, the, the more recent uh, S2S project is the, the so-called uh, climate historical forecast project, which is an extensive uh, multimodal archive of seasonal IMCAS. So we're not talking forecast here, but just you know uh, an, an ability to, to to check what you know how how good we were doing and so forth. So that has been what one one of our instruments to, to to check how, how good we were and so pulling all the, the multi models together to see uh, you know whether systems are improving over time and, and how you can uh, compare them to new 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 models you you want to check uh, those efforts were also complemented by a, a number of dedicated efforts for example to check uh, you know the value of coupling with the land or the ice or the stratosphere and the high pop models. Uh, so you might be familiar with the Blaze project, for example, or ice HFP or strata HFP. All those were, were really looking into the potential of uh, uh, coupling between the atmosphere and, and several uh, connected components uh, of the Earth system. And I'm pretty sure many of the people uh, uh, on the call have been uh, involved in, in one way or another on those projects. All those efforts, they, they really follow the, the concept of uh, model intercomparison projects. So because the, the, it's usually not just a single model who, who is uh, providing the whole value uh, to the effort, but, but by, by bringing those different community efforts together, we make uh, progress jointly. So this is really the, the, the idea behind those uh, collective efforts. Next. So the CHFP, uh, for those who are not familiar with, with, with that database, is, uh, is served at CIMA, uh, so that's in Argentina. Uh, and all those, uh, those data sets are available, uh, and there is a, a, show, uh, you know, a nice uh, web page uh, which allows you to download those, those fields and then uh, uh, play with them. Next. Uh, so Wixip is now running uh, a, a number of uh, sub-projects and just wanted to spend a few minutes on, on, on each one of those. The first one is uh, Snow Glaze. So it's, it's somewhat similar in nature to, to Glaze uh, with the only difference that in, in this example uh, the investigation was about looking at the soil moisture potential predictability that we can attribute to realistic snow initialization. And you see on the, on the plots below uh, how, uh, what kind of impact you can have, well, beneficial, uh, hopefully, uh, that's what you, 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 you would aim for uh, by, by a, a better initialization of, of snow in the system. And that project, the sub-project, is run by Ivan Ossolini and uh, Jai Hun John with a number of partners. Next. Another one is the teleconnection project, uh, looking at the season time scale. It's somewhat similar to what uh, Libby presented earlier, so I'm not going to spend uh, too much time on that. And that project is run by uh, Laura Ferranti, uh, Adam Skyf, and uh, Hervé Duville. Uh, again, I think we should stress here that uh, getting the, the general circulation and uh, the you know, barotropic uh, planetary wave rise, waves rise, and so forth. All, all those large-scale instabilities, we, we better get them right if we want to do a better job uh, also at, at, at the finer scale. So there's no point looking at the, uh, you know, at, at some tiny problem if, if we don't get the, 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 the big problems uh, right in the first place. So that's uh, also why this remains 
a high priority uh, on the seasonal prediction uh, in the seasonal prediction context. And so also uh, Andy will spend a, a bit of time also on uh, the effort on the sub-season to season time scale uh, uh, effort, the corresponding effort here, I think. Next. And the last one I, I wanted to briefly cover is, is the, the sub-project on shocks, so initial shocks uh, in the coupled system and, and, and then longer term drift. That's a project led by uh, Bill Merrifield and uh, Michael Tolstik in particular with a, a non number of other contributors. And we were lo really looking into that problem across all the time scales, not only uh, on the sub-seasonal one, but also seasonal and decadal one. The, the, really the idea here is, is to try to understand uh, to what extent uh, imbalances in the initial conditions cause problem. Uh, because if, if we're not if we are not able to take full advantage of the initial conditions and they better be uh, adjusted across the system and if the data simulation in the couple system uh, uh, doesn't do a good job in terms of uh, transferring the, the information from one component to the other where we can then then we lose the whole benefit of uh, those initial conditions so th that's the first step uh, here uh, under this project is first to understand what are the kind of um, spurious associations or biases uh, that are generated by these imbalances. Next. Uh, Paolo, uh, I think, I think we, can, uh, we can probably, we can probably keep, keep this food that uh, Elizabeth already, already explained during uh, her, her presentation. So, that's great, and, and sorry to interrupt, but it would be great if you could wrap up in the next couple minutes. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So the S2S project uh, has a, mi a mission of to improve forecast skill and understanding on the sub-seasonal to seasonal time scale, and to promote initiatives uh, to uptake by operational center and exploit uh, possibly into the application community, and also to capitalize on both the, the two community and linking to, to the climate services area, which is in WMO, is the global framework for climate services. So the S2S project was five years project started in November 2013 as a first bunch. Then there is an extension, so it's five plus, plus five. And the project office is uh, hosted by, K, by the South Korean Med Services and we have contribution uh, from different countries to the trust fund. So it's a, it's a voluntary, it's based on voluntary contribution and you can see here the, uh, the, the website. Maybe Mitch, you can comment this. Yeah, without also uh, spending too much time, but so, so the S2S uh, prediction project has been organized uh, along a number of sub projects. So uh, interactions and teleconnections between mid latitude and tropics, and Joe, of course, this remains very central uh, because this is really the, the, the critical process around the, the subsidian time scale. Monsoons, and we had a nice workshop, uh, nice workshop on, on that topic. An Africa focus, uh, because we know there are also uh, a number of critical issues in models that we need to, to address there. Extremes, and that was also mentioned previously. And uh, verification, of course, because ultimately we also would like to understand, uh, we need to quantify how, how good we are doing on this. And so this remains also uh, uh, an objective in terms of uh, operation transition, ultimately. Uh, also, to support all that, uh, we have developed that uh, database uh, of uh, subsidence to seasonal prediction products. Next. So the S2S database, uh, so we have basically daily real-time forecasts and also re-forecasts. Uh, they are currently being distributed uh, with three weeks uh, delay, so behind real-time. Although we are also aiming for target periods where we would go live uh, in the future uh, so that we can also demonstrate the real-time value of those. Uh, we use a common grid and we archive a number of about 80 variables, uh, including on the, on the ocean stratosphere and soil moisture and, and so forth. 
Uh, here we see on this slide uh, the number of models contributing contrib well, and centers contributing. Uh, I should point out here that uh, one uh, we should call this uh, ensemble of uh, SWEFs uh, products an ensemble of opportunity because the the start dates are not uh, fully aligned, and this is something uh, uh, we're going to try also to improve uh, on the phase two of the project. Yeah, here we have the last use of the database. As you can see, the statistics, there's a, uh, there are two mirrors. One is hosted by ECNWF, the other one is hosted by the Chinese Meteorological Administration. Here, just as some statistics about the, down, the active user, the download. I think it, this is really a measure of the relevance of this database for research activities uh, around the world. And here you can see an example that uh, back to the last uh, hurricane season with, uh, with the third week prediction starting date, the 24th of August. And you see on one, the, the, the top uh, left, the cyclone energy and the, the bottom uh, right, the strike probability. And you can see in, at the third week with a, with a with a good, uh, a good, uh, interesting results uh, here. Uh, this is another example of of, uh, of applications in the area of subseasonal prediction. I think this is just to complete to say that the the first phase has been completed, and here there are a few key findings. So the skill of MHAO, and this has been already highlighted by Elizabeth in terms of relevance and the, the teleconnection between the NGO area and the Atlantic, the link to the QBO, and also how this is affecting the, uh, the Western Europe uh, cold, cold spell. And there's a lot of work in Euro-Atlantic weather regimes, both for winter and summer season, and how the NAO phases are affecting this, this subseasonal scale. Mitch, your last slide. Yeah, thanks, Paolo. Uh, I just wanted to uh, again advertise the, the upcoming uh, international conferences on uh, subseason to decade predictions, which will be held in uh, Boulder uh, from the 17th to the 21st of September this year. Uh, I, I really encourage you to visit the webpage. The deadline for abstract submission and applications for financial support is 16 of March. Uh, we also would like to acknowledge the, the support of MAP and also all, all the other sponsors. Uh, I must say that personally, uh, and just to second what Paolo said at the beginning, uh, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying this uh, S2S project and the engagement of the, not only the steering committee and the leadership also of Andy and Frederick who have been really instrumental uh, in working really, really, really hard to get this off the ground and, and really uh, getting a very, very strong momentum. And I also realize how important it is to connect to efforts such as MAP uh, because uh, th there is tremendous value in the, in the science being conducted there. Uh, so, so I probably leave it there and uh, thank you again for uh, inviting us to, to this exciting webinar. Well, thank you both for, um, for the great presentation and, and we really appreciate your engagement um, in reverse, uh, I think, you know, you, you both really highlighted the fact that this is a rich uh, topic for both of these communities to handle, and I think we're reflecting that as well over on the NOAA side. Um, so, uh, so thanks for, for presenting the webinar. It's really great to hear about, um, about what's going on internationally and, and, you know, try to keep our role in that uh, really strong. I think it's very important. So, um, so thank you. We really appreciate you both for taking the time to do this. Um, I think we do have to move on uh, in the interest of time. So uh, if there is a question for Mitch or for Paolo, please do send me a chat message and maybe we'll have a couple minutes at the end to go back. Um, I'm going to skip to the next presenter, but I am going to open a poll very quickly and you can kind of fill it out as we, uh, as we move towards the ne next presentation. So um, this is one of two questions. The second question will come up during the next break between speakers, but uh, this is asking what do you think the longest prediction time scale at which um, weather approaches are, are useful. 
and um, so basically how far out into the future, how far out lead times are, are weather forecast approaches useful for, um, for prediction. Um, and again, apologies for the noise in the background. It actually was completely quiet until I pressed the mute button and started talking. Uh, so I hope that it's not causing too much distortion. Anyhow, um, while you fill that poll out, so please please fill that out. You'll have a couple minutes to, to do it. So um, please jump in and, and put your vote in. I'm going to move to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Mike uh, Ventrice. Mike, are you on the line? Hey, I'm here. Hey, I'm here. Okay. Great. Uh, I can hear you, and I'm going to transfer control over to your computer, and then um, you can just share your screen with us. Okay. okay. Fantastic. Okay, great. Mike, looks good. Whenever you're ready, go ahead, please. All right. Thanks for, uh, for, having, for having me speak here today. Um, my name is Mike Ventures. I'm from The Weather Company, um, which is uh, one of the com biggest companies in the private sector here. Um, we offer data-driven products and services to more than 5,000 clients in a number of industry sectors around the globe. Uh, we are considered one of the biggest uh, providers of globally, uh, or, um, globally of atmospheric and weather data. Uh, we run one of the, wor the world's most used cloud platforms uh, with thousands of partners requesting weather data through hundreds of billions of tr daily transactions. Uh, we update our forecasts every 15 minutes uh, for up to 2.2 billion locations around the globe. That's approximately 20 billion forecasts per day on average. Um, we have one of the largest personal weather station networks grown to more than 200,000 reporting stations globally. Um, and we gather weather data from more than 150, 150, 150 data, uh, different sources, um, data like pollen, turbulence, radar, et cetera. Um, uh, we also are grabbing smartphone pressure sensors as well. Um, we have 100, more than 140 meteorologists at the weather company in a variety of roles. Um, so some are forecasters, but other could be into other roles of sales or software engineer. Uh, what truly makes us unique, though, is our company serves both consumers and businesses, which allows us to leverage our, pre our presence in both markets to create the richest, most precise data sets. So um, what I want to talk about today is essentially one of those um, business-type uh, products offerings that we have at the company, and this is specifically regarding our, our energy platform, um, which is uh, called WSI Trader. Now, this is a specifically a sub subscription service. Uh, we provide hourly forecasts, daily forecasts up to 15 days. Also, we, we've been providing sub-seasonal forecasts, which is why I'm here today, uh, which is essentially what we call weeks three through five. Um, but we also other, uh, offer seasonal forecasts out to months one through five. Um, load forecasts, APIs, et cetera. So um, specifically for the talk today, we're going to talk, I'm going to focus on the sub-seasonal and seasonal forecasts. Um, you know, I've been hired at the, I was hired at the company in 2012. Um, so, you know, when I first started, I actually started writing blogs on what the next week, uh, you know, upcoming weeks three through five are going to be to our energy trader clients. Um, and, you know, we, it started off as just this, standard blog, but it evolved. You know, I, I think I missed the blog one week, and I got about 50 emails in my inbox saying, hey, what happened to the subseasonal forecast? Uh, these guys, these traders, really want it, want this information. They're, they're starving for it. Um, there's a lot of action in the natural gas market out in the 16 to 20 day window, um, and and traders want to take these long-term positions on, on, some of the, on some of this data that is out there. So um, a lot of these folks are interested in extreme heat or cold events over t different geographical locations. Um, so they, they find those, you know, the forecast in the 16 to 20 day period very important to what they're, how they're operating their business. Um, what we offer at the company um, is temperature and precipitation forecasts. Uh, we, we've recently got into renewables. So out in our Europe business, we're, you know, a lot of folks are very interested in how uh, 100 meter wind speeds and solar forecasts look like out in the week three, five space. Um, and, you know, this is specifically, it started off as just an energy product, but there are now is a growing traction across multiple platforms and business, such as agriculture, retail, insurance, on, on these types of forecasts. So um, what I thought it would be good to is to kind of show you how some of our processes run and, and some of the product suites that we offer. Um, I specifically geared the talk today to focus on NOAA data. 
um, you know, looking at how we utilize the data that's provided to us. But we do offer a, a, a number of products in, in using eSIMWF data as well. Um, but I'm not going to show that today. I'm just going to show you the no data. So uh, we take um, the zero-hour GFS operational model, uh, the zero-hour forecast, and we, we actually archive that. We've been archiving that for a number of years now. And this is what we use as a, a crude proxy for observations. Um, and I'll show you examples of, of what I mean how we're using this. Uh, for for subseasonal prediction, we are we are utilizing the CFS V2 weekly model, uh, the week three and five forecast that the, that um, model runs every day, um, and, and we have an associated product suite that we make available to our clients. Now, our clients in energy are both um, traders, but also meteorologists. There's a there's a small section of clientele that are actually energy meteorologists, meteorologists that are sitting in a trade floor um, using our, our subscription service. So there are, that, that's why we have some, some complex information there, some of this weather information at these lead times that these users can use. Uh, for seasonal timescales, we do offer uh, the NME climate models that's used in these one to seven forecasts. And again, we also have a product suite available there. So for the GFS zero hour forecast, what I'm calling observations, uh, we're storing the 0, 6, 12, 18 D cycles. Uh, these are the, the in grid format. We've been doing that since 2013. Uh, these are used throughout WSI Trader as what we call observations. So uh, an example here in the bottom is this current MAO forecast, the North Atlantic Oscillation. The green lines, uh, the dark green lines in the boxes here represent observations. Again, that's coming from the GFS zero hour forecast. So this updates in real time. Um, and then we're, we're, we're pending all the other models on there. So you can see there's a pretty significant negative North Atlantic oscillation event forecast to take place during the end of February. Um, we are also providing uh, maps of observations as well as we are computing how well we do out in the week three, four, and five space. So I'm just showing an example of Europe over the past year. Um, I had these stats back to 2014 in Europe when I started doing the Europe platform, and then 2013 for the US. Um, but we, we are all, we're verifying essentially if we correct, if we predict a location, a city, a temperature anomaly, um, say any, it could be above or average or below average. If we hit that correctly, we're saying that's essentially a hit. So. Um, we're, we're, we're scoring ourselves on being able to predict the actual t temperature anomaly sign correctly. Um, so for week 3B, we have a hit rate of 63%. I think we're looking at 72 cities. So if we um, so if we take the number of hits divided by the total number of cities, that's how we're getting this percentage here. Um, but you can see that there's you know periods where we have a ton of skill, and there's there's these big dropouts in skill. Um, we are scoring ourselves against the East of those weekly model as well. So uh, but I didn't include that in this talk. Um, so talking specifically on the subseasonal um, offerings of what we what we provide, we do have a uh, a product that's available in the API uh, where users can subscribe to an API service and then actually grab any set of data points that they want over over the entire globe. Um, we provide week three, four, five uh, forecast of temperature and precipitation. Now these are averaged over the entire week. Um, over we are taking a CFS and Eastern WF blend with equal weighting at the moment. Um, but for the U.S. and Europe specifically, these are human-made forecasts that we push we put into this system, um, and, then, and you know we, we include these types of this type of information in, in the API as well as a report that I issue every Tuesday uh, for the U.S. and every Wednesday for Europe. So we we update our subseasonal forecast once a week. Uh, some of the CFS, CFS V2 product offerings that we offer. Um, Standard things uh, that traders can understand, as well as nets, just uh, simple two-meter temperature anomaly maps uh, in the week three, four, five space, um, as well as precipitation anomaly maps. Now, again, we have this on global grids, so we can go and over go into any domain and extract the data. Um, a little more specific uh, to the, the actual current event that just happened, we just had a recent sudden stratospheric warming event and split this uh, stratospheric polar vortex into sister vortices. Um, our clients are interested in this type of information. So this led to us to try to, you know, build some products out for them to kind of mo monitor this type of variability out in the subseasonal space. And this is one such offering, taking the polar average of 50 millibar temperature anomalies, plotting it, plotting out in time series uh, with observations, and then a CFS V2 forecast just from one day. So we're taking all cycles and plotting them out against each other. And then there's an ensemble mean 
there in the black, yellow dot, dotted line there. Uh, this was from February 12th. Um, again, the observations here, that's from our zero zero hour TFS dot forecast. And I thought this was an interesting case to kind of share with the group. You know, we had a that recent strat warming. Um, but looking in the CFS, the old forecast, this was on January 30th, it really didn't handle the strat warming all that well. It completely missed the amplitude in the sun stratosphere, uh, you know, essentially the split of the vortex when it was out in that week three domain. As it came out forward in time, you can see how much, how verification uh, was much warmer in that, in that 50 millibar level than what the model was predicting. So um, there's some interesting case study here to kind of explore. Uh, we do provide maps of these types of fields. So 50 millibar temperature anomalies are in the shading. We have the geopotential height fields and the contours. Again, these are just uh, things for usually energy methods that I'd like to use, not, not specifically the trader. Um, we are providing 50, 500 millibar geopotential height anomalies on a global grid, um, as well as 200 millibar velocity potential anomalies. And uh, here, the negative anomaly here represents uh, essentially the upper level divergence, uh, whereas this the overlevel convergence is indicated by the positive anomalies, the reds and, and pinks. And I use this field because uh, it's really great at tracking uh, tropical, tropical phenomena, such as the Madden Julian oscillation, um, and, and essentially to measure the, the atmosphere coupling to low frequency modes in the tropics, such as ENSA, uh, which I'll show you in a, in a few minutes. Um, so I'm taking this data and using those, that observation data set from the GFS op, and I'm uh, then able to provide uh, filtered data, uh, such as we can wait, we can uh, filter this in wave number frequency just to identify the MGO band, and we are providing six-week forecasts from the CFS um, in either map form or HOD model format. So uh, the traders kind of like these maps better, but you know the, the energy maps and tropical meteorologists like myself really like these HOD modelers. You can see the, how the evolution has progressed over the, the past number of months and then what the CFS V2 forecast is showing. Um, we take this data, this MJO filter data, and we run statistical models on it to help us make predictions down the week three to five space. Um, so you can use uh, a, a time threshold. Uh, I think we're using a 30-day sliding window on the current date. And you can an, an amplitude threshold. You can take the uh, specific longitude of the MJO uh, active phase, the indicated by the black dash contours, um, and take the, retain the amplitude, and you can make these statistical forecasts. And this is, I apologize, this is a little blurry here. Uh, the left image is a 500 over height anomaly forecast, and the right is a surface temperature anomaly forecast uh, over Europe. And this was made back on January 31st, and our MGO uh, filter, uh, our statistical model was predicting a fairly significant negative North Atlantic oscillation, Greenland blocking high uh, to set up, and that was forecast to make Europe go, you know, quite cold. Um, and, and this was the time frame here. We're looking at a week three to six aggregate. I actually provide these maps on weekly time scales as well. Um, but this was covering this, the, the, the time frame of February 13th through March 13th. And, you know, if we were looking at the upcoming six to 10 day forecast in this window, we're seeing quite the Arctic air mass intrusion across Europe from this big negative NAO. So uh, not knowing anything about the stratosphere, not knowing anything about dynamical models, our, you know, we were able to successfully uh, give our clients warning in, in the Europe side that there was a robust blocking Greenland, um, a Greenland blocking ridge that was uh, our, our analog model was predicting. So it was a good case study. Um, something else that you know we've been working on and doing some internal research on is um, low frequency filtered upper level velocity potential anomalies. Uh, the blue shading represents uh, essentially again where the air has been diverging aloft over. A number of days, and then the, the yellow and, and orange shading represents upper level convergence at the low frequencies. And this is essentially a way to monitor the atmosphere coupling to ENSO um, or, or any other low frequency mode in the tropics for that matter, because it can happen um, not, not necessarily just over the Eastern Pacific, right, in the ENSO 3.4 3 <laughs> domain, but at this, this beast, anyways, can happen anywhere on the planet. So we're, we're, we're extracting this information and, and finding. Uh, common patterns that set up, and you know, this is just a, a, some of the research that we've done using that that low frequency filtered blast potential, finding you know specific longitude points where that signal has been active in history. In history, um, and and you can find the winter composite. This is December, to February, 500 over height anomalies. This is a standard El Nino forcing location when the atmosphere is coupled there. 
And you see the, the common El Nino type pattern, big Gulf of Aleutian uh, cyclone and a downstream split flow of the U.S. Now you can move these these boxes anywhere, these, these standing waves set up anywhere, so you can move it further west and we can see how these types of composites evolve going from El Nino to La Nina type forcing. And there's the La Nina classic composite where you have the big North, North Pacific high downstream cold drop over western Canada, but you can continue going across the maritime continent or even over the Indian Ocean. And you can see how the composites really vary here, though the, uh, the, the sample size is pretty small when you get over that Indian Ocean domain, but um, we have instances where these standing waves set up with the Indian Ocean rather than, you know, the Pacific. So these are types of things that we're trying to understand in making better skillful forecasts. Um, something else that we've been looking at is, you know, the amplitude is mat it really matters when trying to make skillful sub or seasonal predictions as well. You can go from a, just keeping that forcing mechanism um, over the, the low frequency signal over the 120 degree west longitude, so just over the eastern Pacific. These are the strong El Nino cases where you get that big Gulf of Aleutian cyclone. But if you weaken it to moderate El Nino, just using a, an amplitude threshold, you can see how the composite really changes. You start to see more of that uh, downstream split flow, that ridge kind of lift towards Greenland. And then if you get to the weaker forecast, you actually can get a sign change, or sign change in the amplitude over the North Pacific, and you get this classic negative NAO type pattern. So um, you know, these are things that we consider in our statistical models when trying to make these forecasts. Um, trying to explain what we just went over to traders is nearly impossible. So uh, we, did we did take that low frequency filter uh, velocity potential and convert it into an index, which is what we call the atmospheric ENSO index. And essentially where the index is negative, it represents La Nina type forcing. You got the standing wave over the maritime continent, West Pacific. If the index is positive, it's El Nino. We have that standing wave over this uh, central eastern Pacific. And then we're quantifying that. Um, you can standardize this index. So these are all standardized anomalies, and you can see how the daily evolution is with the CFS V2 forecast dependent on there. Um, you know, we, using this index, it was really great uh, back in 2015, uh, indicated by the green line here, to tell our clients, hey, we, you know, the atmosphere is locked into this super El Nino back in late July, early August, um, with legs into the winter, and we were able to give this type of information. You know, even the ocean, the ocean uh, ENSO 3.4 index may not have shown the nature of the super El Nino back in July or August, our atmospheric me metric showed that coupling was the strongest on record. And, and um, this was something to give us a good stance in the winter saying, hey, you know, this is a good indication that temperatures are going to be pretty warm across the U.S. Uh, for winter. So um, I don't want to go over time here. Just uh, to go quickly through some of the seasonal offerings that we have, uh, we've been doing this for over 15 years now. Uh, we incorporate a number of seasonal models into our forecast, ECWF, the N now the NMME models, as well as CANSIP. Um, you know, we are building out a probabilistic platform for this. So right now, version one will probably be just the ECWF, where we're going to calibrate and bias correct, but we plan to extend that into the CFS as well in version two, and potentially the NME in version three. Um, so that's something that we've been working on over the past uh, number of months. Some of the NMME specific product offerings that we uh, make available to our clients, uh, temperature anomaly maps for the current more, uh, forecast month, uh, and then how those, those temperatures have changed since last forecast to see any trends or any notable trends in the models. Uh, we do the same thing for precipitation anomalies, showing above or below average precipitation on a global grid, and again, where things have changed compared to the previous month. Um, regarding some more of the savvier traders, or mainly the meteorologists, we are providing um, uh, sea surface temperature anomaly forecasts, and, and again, how those have changed the previous month. Um, we, we are build, build, bidding these out into the ENSO domain, um, the, the climate, you know, the, the standard 3.4, 1.6, et cetera, how um, the models are behaving. This is a nice example where CFS V2 seems to be a bit of an outlier here. Um, and then we're taking this data and we're, you know, we can apply some math on it, doing the UFs and uh, provide uh, Pacific decadal oscillation forecasts. So if anyone, you know, this is probably more specific to uh, some of the ag guys or some of the people interested in, in uh, Northwest uh, precipitation and snowpack uh, forecasts for seasonal. But, um, and we're doing the same for the Atlantic multi decadal oscillation. Um, we did do some research on uh, the NMME and how well these models are predicting temperatures in the U.S. 
Um, what we were actually doing, we, we did this for precipitation as well, uh, and, and we looked at Europe as well. Um, we're breaking these down into uh, monthly initialization forecasts with lead times out there. So you can see some interesting things, like in November, we're seeing this enhanced skill compared to the other months on both sides, and that seems to propagate forward in time. Um, but we're not really sure what that's caused by, but uh, these are some of the types of, you know, research that we're doing. Um, and again, we're, we, we can look at all how, you know, how all the climate models are doing, the enemy uh, component models are doing by lead time over all months. Um, you know, the goal here is to, to create some sort of skill weighted blend rather than just an equal 50, uh, you know, an equal weighting on all the enemy components. Uh, that's something we've been working on over the past year as well. Uh, so just to conclude here, um, to keep in my time stream, uh, time constraint, uh, we do use a lot of NOAA data here inside the weather company. This is mainly our energy-focused business, but it's not limited to that. Uh, just that's where I've been using this data um, for our clients. It seems like there's a good, there's a strong need there. Um, you know, we, we use the GFS zero-hour uh, zero forecast as our observational data sets. Um, it's just a crude way, um, but that's, it seems to be doing the job here. And then um, we are using the CFSB2 as a component model to substitute the forecast, but we also use the ESMWF model as well, which we also have a completely different product suite there, um, such as uh, clustering and, and uh, you know, how, how those clusters have been performing, et cetera. Um, and, and for seasonal timescales, the NME model is used. Um, we are planning to calibrate this and, and to build this out into probabilistic type platform uh, using the individual ensemble members. Um, we're hoping to have this at daily resolution, um, but that's something that is on the roadmap for the next coming months. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you for inviting, us, uh, for inviting me, and uh, hope you found it useful. Uh, thanks a lot, Mike. I, I, I definitely really enjoyed that talk. I thought it was fascinating to hear about all these value-added products you guys uh, produce. Um, as well as the importance of some of these, you know, NOAA data sets and forecast products. So uh, that was really fascinating. I, I have a ton of questions for you alone. I'm sure others do as well, and unfortunately we have to move along just to keep pace. Um, but uh, that was really great. Thank you, for, thank you for taking the time to present. Uh, and awesome. hopefully you don't mind if I email you or others email you with questions. That's fine. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to put up the, the next poll, and uh, we'll jump over to the next speaker. So this is a corollary to the previous poll. It's a similar question, but um, looking from the climate modeling and climate prediction perspective at what the shortest timescales are at which uh, climate prediction methodologies um, and related methodologies can provide useful information. So instead of long timescales for weather prediction, we're looking at shortest timescales for climate prediction. So uh, please try to answer that question. And uh, we're going to jump to the next speaker. Uh, next speaker is Andy Robertson from Columbia University. Um, we have two speakers remaining, Andy and Ben. I think both of them participate in the S2S task force, which starts at 2 o'clock. Uh, so we're getting close to that. Um, it's an S2S marathon today. So I'll just ask Andy and Ben if you both can try to keep it um, as close to 15 minutes or under as possible. That would be uh, great. Um, so Andy, are you there? Can you hear me, Ben? I can hear you. Yep. Can you hear me? I just turned control okay, over to your computer, so if you can share your screen, that'd be great. Okay. Oh, looks good. Okay. okay. Great. Whenever you're ready, can go you ahead. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Dan, for the invitation. I, I just have a few slides. So uh, what I'll do is uh, to provide uh, an update on the S2S, the international S2S project, and uh, uh, some linkages that we see with the, the MAP S2S effort that, that Libby. Uh, that, that Libby described. So this will follow on from the nicely from the talk that uh, Mitch and, and Paolo, Paolo gave with background on the S2S project. So I, I don't need to uh, uh, cover that. Uh, the status of the project is, as, as uh, Mitch and Paolo said, that uh, it, 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 it started about five years ago and we're actually coming up to the end of our five years. And the thinking was that it would be potentially reviewed after five years. And so what we've been now doing now in the last year is actually putting together a proposal for the, a five-year extension for uh, 2018 to 2023. So S2S phase two, and that will uh, hopefully be finally approved by the WMO Executive Congress in uh, June of this year. 
it's already been, uh, the, we've, we've written a proposal, it's already been approved by the WWRP's uh, scientific uh, committee and the WWRP's uh, joint scientific uh, steering committee. So uh, we, we, think we're on, we think we're on a good track. So I'll tell you a little bit about the, the plans and I think you'll see there's, there's many uh, synergies with the, with the MAP uh, research that Libby described. So the, the first one is to enhance the database. So we feel that this has been a, a big success of, of the project, uh, putting together this uh, database with, uh, you know, the output from uh, 11 operational centers, as Mitch said, you know, a database of opportunity, which is a little bit different from the sub-X one that, that Ben will describe. So what are we going to do uh, in, in phase two? Uh, one of the things is that uh, we'd always uh, plan to have ocean variables in the database. Uh, they haven't been available as of yet, uh, but they will, they will be added. We'll add more, more surface variables four times daily. So generally the, the, uh, the data in the database is, is daily, uh, but, but we realize for some, for some applications and, and, and research, uh, having uh, four times daily data is, is useful. So at the moment we only have precipitation, but we'll be adding a few surface variables, especially for land surface studies and then uh, potentially additional models uh, may, may be added to the database. And we're in, uh, currently in conversation with the Indian Met Department uh, to add their, their model to the database. So the first, first part of the plan is uh, database enhancement. Uh, the second one is on some re new research foci, uh, which will be, would be uh, focused more on how can we improve uh, the forecast with more specifically in terms of uh, some coordinated uh, numerical experiments that could be done to, to try to really you know, coordinate research on improving the models and, potent and specifically, you know, some of the, the main sources of predictability that uh, are, are there on the sub subseasonal time scale. So MJO prediction and teleconnections, that'll be, that'll be a continuation really of the, the current uh, project on that. Uh, one will be on ocean and sea ice initialization and configuration, uh, one on land surface initialization configuration, uh, a new one on atmospheric composition, aerosols, uh, one specifically on ensemble generation and one on the stratosphere. So uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll say a few words uh, about each of those. The third, the, the third component of, of the plans is to enhance the operational infrastructure because this is, you know, really uh, keyed into the operational cent operational centers, the, in the international S2S project, as well as the, the, the user applications. And we're proposing uh, to have a, a real-time pilot. So really the, the two, well, of the three components, you know, there's, there's more uh, targeted research work on some of the, the, uh, the, the modeling and also more consideration of well, can we really show value to applications and, and can we really help uh, the, the operational infrastructure for, for S2S? So the, the, uh, the S2S research foci, uh, the first one here on, on MJO prediction and teleconnections, and specifically here we're highlighting uh, MJO uh, impacts on high impact weather, as uh, Libby was also showing with that, that case of uh, the uh, atmospheric rivers and uh, tropical, tropics, subtrop in, in tropics and subtropics uh, and potential for us to have skill in those. And then more generally, MJO, uh, tropical, extratropical teleconnections uh, and extratropical prediction skills. So for example, here on the right, you can see uh, a little thumbnail here of uh, composites of uh, 500 millibar hectopascal, sorry, 500 millibar height uh, three pentads after MJO in phase three. And so this has been compared uh, across all the models. And so you can see this but the kind of thing where the S2S database really comes in, where you can compare the teleconnection pattern between the era interim in, in the top left here with all of the models. And then you, you can see some, some systematic, uh, you, you can see something that the models are getting right. So they are uh, uh, getting this, uh, they, 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 they tend to get the uh, teleconnection in, in the Atlantic, uh, but often don't get it don't get it strong enough. For for example, the second one on land initialization and, and configuration, 
Uh, that, so that, that's, that's going to be a specific focus with impact on the, the, what's the impact of the observing system on land initialization and forecast, uh, the representation of coupled land uh, atmosphere processes in, in S2S models, and also the, the contribution of land surface states to extremes. So there may be some uh, coordinated experiments in, in that area. The, uh, we, we have, uh, we have a, as, I, as I mentioned, we have a proposal that, uh, for, for the phase two, but it, it's still you know, really at the, the more general level, and we're thinking we'll, this will be evolved as we, we move into the phase two of the, the project. So uh, none of this, th these are sort of broad areas and the specific experiments, for example, haven't, haven't uh, be, been, been laid out in, in detail. Uh, ocean and sea ice initialization and configuration. So we've got both the ocean and the, and the sea ice here. Uh, role of ocean atmosphere coupling. Uh, we're, we're thinking that, that this, you know, in addition to the land surface, these, these are areas and the stratosphere, the, the one at the bottom here, the area that maybe haven't been looked at as much at, as, at, in the first phase of S2S, where we think there's a lot of potential uh, for, for research to improve the skill by better understanding, for example, there's the role of ocean atmosphere coupling, uh, maybe in uh, middle latitude ocean, ocean fronts, for example, Gulf Stream extension, Kuroshio, uh, how these are represented in the models, etc. Uh, current capabilities for sea ice uh, process simulation, so some, some focus on the process as well as uh, prediction and sensitivity to, to initial state. Uh, and then another aspect here could be a predictability of, uh, of uh, sub-seasonal marine variability. So things more applications uh, related such as to uh, fisheries or, or coral bleaching. One on ensemble generation. Uh, as Mitch mentioned, this is really a, a database of opportunity where we have some centers such as ECMWF that do uh, burst initialization with 51 members every Monday and every, every Thursday uh, versus centers like, like NCEP uh, that, that do uh, uh, eight, eight every day, 16 per day, sorry, in the real time. So uh, what, what's the impact of that? Uh, what's the uh, relative importance of a random versus systematic errors in, in forecast spread? Uh, potential benefits of stochastic uh, parameterization? Uh, how can we benchmark the uh, spread error relationship uh, from, from the S2S models? So really, you know, getting to the question of uh, can, we, uh, can we recommend uh, approaches to uh, the way that ensembles are generated specifically for this sub-seasonal uh, time scale of uh, two weeks to a season ahead. Uh, a new activity here, one that, that's sort of garnering a lot of interest in, in various realms, you know, especially in climate, climate change, but we're also seeing that in the, in the weather time scale, uh, impact of prognostic aerosols. Uh, how, 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 would, uh, how could they help us improve uh, forecast skill on the one hand, what's the, the, the level of uh, complexity needed? Uh, how about uh, predictability of, of aerosols for, for applications uh, such, as, such as dust, dust aerosols? And then at the bottom here, the stratosphere, uh, the role of vertical coupling, uh, stratospheric uh, systematic errors, and again, impact of quality of uh, stratospheric initial conditions. So I think you're seeing some parallels there between the stratosphere, ocean, and, and land here in terms of uh, role of initial conditions, uh, systematic errors, uh, processes of, of representing the, the key processes in the model. And this is all schematic here on the right, just showing uh, that this will really build the stratosphere one, be built and be led by work uh, done by Spark's uh, uh, stratospheric uh, network on, on uh, predictive on assessment of predictability the SNAP. And they've been, they've been very active in phase one. This is an example from them of a week, week three uh, surface uh, anomaly correlations for uh, neutral stratospheric vortex situations. So here you have all the models lined up here. And the one at the bottom here, when you have stra strong stratospheric uh, vortex conditions. So you can see there's a lot more skill in, in those cases. 
So there's, there's, there's work, to build, work to build on there and uh, move forward. So those are the, the research foci. Uh, in the, the third component that I've mentioned, enhancing operational infrastructure, uh, user applications and, and real-time pilot, uh, the, here we want to uh, promote and develop into comparison of different methodologies for the calibration, multi-model combination, the verification. Uh, these are all extremely, extremely important uh, for thinking about uh, you know, forecast formats and, and products. How can we uh, produce probabilistically reliable, the best, the most, the most accurate and reliable uh, probabilistic formats uh, for, for sub-seasonal forecasts? And here on the right, an example of of some work we've been doing at IRI, you may recognize this as being similar to what we have on the seasonal scale for here for precipitation probability of below normal versus above normal, whereas in this case, it's for a week two to three, so this is uh, uh, 15 to 50 to, to 28 days uh, or, uh, time scale, uh, or I should say uh, eight, to, eight to 21 uh, uh, days ahead, a particular case here, this was from the 3rd of August last year, the time when we had uh, actually Hurricane Harvey. So uh, that, that's, that will be a, a focus. Then also more on the operational side, making recommendations to operational centers to harmonize their real time and, and reforecast setups. So one of the successes we had uh, in the phase one that all now, all of the 11 centers that contribute to the database are uh, issuing their real-time forecast on Thursdays. So this is already some coordination that, that, that we've achieved. But if you look at the re-forecast setups, they're all very different. So there's still some work to, to uh, and it's obviously more challenging to, to coordinate uh, work on, on the re-forecasts. Uh, so that's something we'll work toward. And then to, to work with the, ex the WMO's expert team for operational prediction on sub-seasonal sub to, to longer, longer time scales to develop standards, uh, to define cri criteria for, for designation uh, potentially of global producing centers for sub-seasonal predictions. So we have those for, for seasonal predictions that we don't have for sub-seasonal yet. And then establishing uh, standards for, for data exchange and delivery of, of S2S hindcast and real-time forecasts through the WMO uh, the system, so the lead center for long-range forecasting, multi-model ensembling. So currently, they do have access. This is the, the, the lead center can can pick up uh, the the, uh, the the forecast without the three-week delay uh, from the S2S database. Uh, so that we we are very closely connected uh, with the with with the lead center, and and we'll, we'll build build on this. So this is one pathway. Uh, to, to WMO, WMO users. At the bottom here, uh, the, uh, a big, a big uh, initiative that we're planning here is to establish a, a, a pilot program of, of real-time access to the database. So for in specifically for demonstrating value of, of S2S forecasts. So this would be just for one to two years duration, limited time, uh, it would be uh, so it would make the data or some subset of it available in the real time uh, without the three week lag uh, to a, a subset of, of agreed, agreed upon projects. And we're working with the uh, closely with the, the WWRP's uh, working group on uh, societal and economic research for applications uh, project to, to help design this. And really, the goal here would be to demonstrate uh, to the WMO members or community: uh, can we re can, do we really have? Can we demonstrate forecast value uh, of such forecasts? So hey, Andy, that sorry to interrupt, but uh, please try to wrap up in the next couple of minutes if you can. Thanks. Will do. So I won't go through. I won't go through all these projects, but I think it's pretty, it should be pretty clear, you know, how uh, the, the these activities in, in the phase two uh, connect with many of the research activities uh, that, that, uh, that uh, Libby out, outlined in, in, in the first talk. So uh, just to mention that we now, in addition to the, uh, our, the, the official archiving centers at CMA and ECMWS, we also have the, the S2S database from all the centers 
archived in the IRR data library, uh, kept up to date three times, three, three weeks behind real time for the refor for the real time forecast, all the reforecast. So you should be able to find everything there in the IRI data library as well. Uh, we're doing our best to maintain this. And then what what Ben will will uh, talk about in his talk, the sub X. So they're they're both there in in, in the IRI data library. So main points. Uh, S2S phase one was significantly strengthened by MAP funded S2S research. Uh, I can confidently say that. Uh, you know, the, the, the MAP activity is the largest regional activity uh, and, and in the S2S realm. And the, the S2S project, the international project, can't fund research. It's just going to only play a coordinating and stimulating role. So we, we're, we're, we're very happy and, and, and with, with what, uh, what has happened in the, in the MAP project over over the US. Uh, there's opportunities to, to, uh, for, for S2S clearly to leverage the MAP funded research in phase two. Uh, look forward to that. Uh, SubX and S2S databases, both in, in the IRI data library. So we really think this can facilitate their use in conjunction with one another. And then finally, uh, the SubX is obviously in real time. So we think that this is something that uh, could, be, could be very useful in, in our in, uh, in our proposed real-time pilot. I mean, the idea of the real-time pilot is uh, for people really to, to uh, see value in things. That, uh, stakeholders want to see something done in real time. So that's the whole motivation for this. And obviously, uh, SubX is, is in real time too. So thank you for your attention. That, that's, all, that's all. Great, Andy. That was a really nice um, overview. And um, I think we'll just continue with the theme of, of not having questions answered during this webinar, um, unfortunately, uh, just given the time. But, but that was great. And I actually have a poll question that I think you set up very nicely on your research question slide. Um, so this poll is, is basically getting at what uh, type of developments are most urgently needed um, to advance prediction skills. So this includes both dynamical modeling, prediction systems, statistical modeling, et cetera. Um, and people are encouraged to choose uh, five or four options, I believe. Um, so please choose your, your top four. Um, and this will be open for another four and a half minutes. So anyhow, Andy, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. And it'll be interesting to see the results of this and, and perhaps get your commentary after the webinar is over um, on, what, what folks, uh, on, on what folks choose here. Okay, our final speaker is Ben Kurtman. Ben, you on the line? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. And I just pass the ball over to you so you can share your screen with us. Looks great. Thank you, Ben. Sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just want to talk about the SubX project. Um, um, brevity is not my long suit, but I'll, I will try to be brief. You, uh, your we'll long suit? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to long add suit. a little slip. <laughs> so, anyways, this is the, the SubX team uh, listed here. You can see there's quite a few people involved, so we've got lots of, lots of moving parts, and, um, um, and that's always a challenge to coordinate these things. Uh, the first you know, a couple of points I want to uh, cover is, is really the SubX project. Uh, you've heard a lot about it today already. I just want to be clear, it, is, it isn't the NMME project. Uh, the NMME project is operational, and um, uh, the SubX project is still an experimental project and involves a different collection of models and a different collection of uh, participants and certainly a different mission. So I just want to make sure that, that uh, people understand that these are two separate projects. The NMME project, however, did, ha did have a sub-seasonal experiment, uh, and that included just a, a set of test cases for the month of November. Uh, it was a sort of a 15-year hindcast period where we produced some high-frequency output um, and high-frequency initialization, and that was sort of used as a, as a I would say, a, a, a forerunner for how to design the um, uh, sub-seasonal protocol. And so I'm going to describe the sub-seasonal protocol I'm going to talk a little bit about the reforecast data that Andy has uh, pointed you to, which includes both uh, the reforecast data and the real-time data is on that IRI website that Andy pointed out. And that data has been available uh, since uh, August 2017 and, and uh, continues to grow as, as we speak. And just for the sake of brevity, I'm going to show some uh, reforecast uh, skill metrics, uh, deterministic assessment of the forecast quality. 
and uh, given time, I think that's about all I'll cover. Uh, one thing I do want to emphasize is we have completed uh, the uh, reforecast period in support of the real-time forecast. So this, the reforecasts are uh, definitively necessary for uh, identifying the systematic error, removing model climatologies, uh, skill assessments, and calibration. So uh, just, just real quickly, the prediction systems are up to the forecast provider. Uh, we have a, you know, a simple rule, the real-time and retrospective systems should be identical. The uh, reforecast period is 1999 through 2017, and that, that database is complete now, I believe. Uh, there uh, one exception, which I'll point out. Uh, in the hindcast and the retrospective forecasts, there's at least three ensemble members. Um, in the real-time forecasts, in the case of the ones we do here at the University of Miami, uh, we do nine ensemble members in real time, and our hindcast data set is three ensemble members. The uh, minimum length is 32 days. Some of these systems go out quite a bit further. Um, uh, for example, the ones we do here go out 45 days. Uh, we make the forecast available, the real-time forecasts, uh, by five, available by 5 p.m. every Wednesday of every single week. And the data is on a uniform grid, one by one grid, uh, and that facilitates uh, model combinations and, and uh, things like that. Is just showing you our current data holdings as of February 14th. Uh, the uh, Environmental Canada forecasts do their, do their uh, reforecast on the fly, so they, this hasn't been fully populated yet, but you will notice all the other uh, six participants have uh, fully populated their hindcasts over the entire period. Uh, we have two different kinds of data sets. We have, you know, priority one and priority two. And so we're still filling in the priority two data sets, and we're still working on filling in the uh, CFS data. We have surface temperature and precip at the moment, but we have several other, other fields that need to be filled in. Uh, just, just, to, just to give you an idea, this is looking, you know, really the SubEx project focuses on week three and four, maybe week three and four combined. It's, uh, it's uh, sort of, a, I would say, an, uh, a subset of the subseasonal problem. Uh, given that we only go out to 32 days, so it's not quite filling in that whole subseasonal range. This particular map is showing you uh, the anomaly correlation over the period 1999 through 2014 for August through October uh, for the various models for two meter temperature. In this case, two meter temperature is the average of the T2 min, T2 max, so we just take the average of those two to define it. And so we're showing the skill of the individual models and then the multi-model, the, uh, or the correlation coefficient, I should say. The uh, value in parentheses is showing you the um, uh, area, area averaged correlation coefficient. And so, uh, you know, you can see by eye, the individual models are not necessarily as good as the multi-model ensemble. Um, we can argue about which model is best, but certainly the NCEP CFS has a, a, a notably higher correlation coefficient for this particular lead time, this particular variable, and this particular verification season. And these things change. When you look at a different verification season, a different lead time, um, you're going to see different, uh, you know, which models are in the lead are, are different. And just to show you, if you just go to the next three months, uh, looking at initial conditions in the next three months, you see some, you definitely see some changes of, uh, in terms of these skill scores. But again, uh, that multi-model ensemble sort of pops out uh, above the, uh, any of the individual models uh, score. Uh, and then um, moving on uh, to October, November, December, again, same kind of result. There is, uh, uh, even in week three, quite a bit of skill uh, throughout much in North America in the multi-model ensemble and even in, the, in some of the individual ensemble members and we're able to sort of capitalize on that in the multi-model ensemble. Um, uh, and again, the multi-model ensemble is notably, you know, uh, pretty much the best model on the, on the page. But you can see, for example, the GEPS model in this particular lead time uh, is quite competitive with NCEP, whereas the CFS, whereas CFS before was, was the lead model. So there's it always blinks in and out which model leads, and basically the NMME sort of, the multi-model ensemble sort of smooths that out. It's not always the best model, but it's certainly uh, overall uh, uh, among the best models. And then again, uh, this is looking at NDJ, again, just, just week three, 
and you know you can you can stare at these maps uh, all day long and you know focus on you know where 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 what region is of your interest in terms of these correlation coefficients. And again, this is just the correlation coefficient. We're still you know this project is is uh, uh, is only a year and a half old. It's and it's only a two year project. The first year was really filling out the the set of hindcasts, and we started doing the real time forecasts on in July. And um, uh, so we're just now r really digging in and trying to make those uh, those skill assessments. And the real time forecast will only go for for one year. It's a two year project. So um, we're sort of trying to prove our our utility. Uh, we have another six months of, or slightly less than six months of real time forecast. Uh, just to go out when you go beyond week three, if you look at week four, not surprising, this is uh, this uh, October, November, December period, not surprising there's a notable drop off in skill. Uh, and for this particular lead time, you can see that, you know, there are some uh, uh, small differences between what I would argue is sort of the best model there, CFS V2 uh, and the NMME, but really fairly close in terms of their uh, skill scores for uh, their correlation coefficient of two meter temperature for this particular lead time. So not a, not a whole lot of difference uh, in week four for this particular lead time. So there are times when an individual for different lead times and different variables and different verification times when, when you can't say the, you know, definitively the multi-model ensemble is the best, but just sort of overall it'll, it'll stand up. Uh, and then when you look at individual forecasts, there are going to be times when a particular model will uh, outperform the multi-model ensemble. Uh, precipit uh, this is precipitation, this is uh, NDJ, uh, this is week three, so not surprising, precipitation is a tough one, and so these numbers are quite a bit lower. Uh, nevertheless, I, I do think these results are pretty encouraging. Uh, we're seeing some hints of, of skill at week three and, on, on the eastern half of the U.S. and the western half of the U.S. Uh, it's clear the, you know, it seems pretty clear to me the multi-model ensemble is able to mine a certain amount of uh, predictability that's uh, absent in any individual model. Uh, so this is fairly encouraging, uh, you know, despite the fact that these numbers are low. If you look at seasonal forecasts, um, those numbers are also quite low uh, for precipitation um, uh, of uh, skill score, uh, correlation coefficient. So. Not too bad here. Um, uh, you know, perhaps you want to see you know much bigger numbers, but precip is tough. This is uh, this is what we can do. Uh, and just to show you, uh, it, uh, Kathy uh, Kathy has set up a nice um, a website that you can actually look at uh, the forecasts in real time in, in graphical format. And so this is the, uh, the week three, four, two meter temperature. This is valid for uh, two weeks. Uh, um, ending it the two weeks, so it's three and four averaged in the two weeks ending on March 16th. And so you can see in this particular case, there's a, there is a fair amount of agreement among the models, and that stands out in the multi-model ensemble. If you look in the, the southeast U.S., there's some, there's some differences among them, and, and then the multi-model ensemble gives a fairly small anomaly. But certainly over the northeast of North America, there's a big positive anomaly. In the west, there's a big negative anomaly in the and the, uh, those things stand out pretty clearly in the multi-model ensemble. Uh, rainfall, the signals are a lot less uh, robust for this particular forecast. It varies uh, across models, so there's a lot of, quite a bit of differences, but uh, certainly the wet uh, in the uh, subtropical Pacific and dry in the northern part of the Pacific seems to jump out in all the models, and uh, you do have some signals in the west, west of the U.S. Uh, that are consistent with that. So, you know, we're running out of time here, so I just, I, just want to, I just want to emphasize a couple of things. We have seven models uh, that are participating that are, have provided their retrospective forecasts for that 17-year period. Uh, we're quite proud of that. Uh, we have all the priority one variables. There's quite a few of those variables, and we're rapidly working on the priority two variables. We are well into uh, the one year of real-time forecasts, and uh, we have been delivering on time, in real time, all the time. Uh, we've done a little over six months of that. It started in July, uh, and uh, we're, 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 quite, we're quite proud of that. And at the SubX project, what's you know, perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of it is its collaboration and uh, uh, customer relationship with the operational forecast. So not only do we have operational forecasters 
being collaborators in the project, the operational forecasters are also customers in that they use these forecasts in order to issue the official uh, three, week three, four guidance. And so that, that to me is a really, really strengthens the relationship of the project, but also um, uh, really that collaboration, uh, not just having them as customers, really tells us what, what information is needed and uh, how to evaluate these forecasts. So uh, that's really the SubX project in a nutshell. We're really focusing on week three, four right now um, and trying to assess the multi-model skill. There's some real indications that the um, a combination of the models, and at least in terms of these deterministic measures of correlation, and I didn't show RMS error, but, but RMS error that uh, this, the uh, skill of forecasts are improving with the multi-model ensemble. In some sense, we were expecting that. We're working on probabilistic measures, assessing the reliability of the forecast. That's certainly one of the most important things. And we've also established a set of working groups to look at um, more process or phenomenological uh, elements. So we, of course, have our working group that focuses on uh, forecast verification, but we also have a group that's working on the MJO forecast, how well the models are doing there. We have a group that's thinking about the NAO forecast, and, and people are actually interested in the MJO and NAO interaction. So we're doing the, we're doing the science of you know, experimental prediction, What's, what are we predicting and how well the models are doing from both a phenomenological and process-oriented level, and we're also doing that hard-nosed, uh, real-time forecast for, and retrospective forecast verification. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Ben, that was great, and um, all blame on me for not being a better timekeeper and <laughs> leaving you at the short end of the stick um, at the end here. But uh, I think that was a really no nice overview, and um, and thank you for for pr providing it. Actually, I think uh, you're pointing at the end towards the fact that there's a really rich set of, of activity going on in the um, subseasonal experiment uh, group. And, um, and, and, you know, I'm thinking that maybe actually a, a fuller webinar dedicated to, to sub-X um, perhaps, uh, you know, in June or so could be, um, could be of interest and we can, you know, hear from a lot of other speakers and you can have more time as well to, to dig into some of the science if you'd be interested. Oh, yeah, I, I, would, I would strongly uh, 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 like to do that. I think that would be good. There's so much going on in that project that um, I'm sure everybody would like to present something. That's great. All right. Well, we'll, we'll curate that and, and try to hold that um, soon. So thank you so much, Ben, and thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to the uh, folks who, who participated. Uh, really appreciate the engagement on this webinar. Um, we, we got some decent responses to the polls. I'd say usually about a third of people responded to the polling um, questions. And uh, we're not going to have time to present them now or discuss them, but we will post the results on the website. On the webinar website, it will be up on the webinar page. Probably take us a couple days. We'll also put the recording of this up there as well as the slides, which the presenters have kindly supplied. Um, and uh, I hope this was a stimulating webinar. I think there's a lot of great activity going on internationally for S2S and, um, and a lot of activity that we're supporting in the U.S. Um, that's complementary to that. And, um, and I think it was, it was really kind of a fascinating group of talks today. So uh, I really am very appreciative of all the speakers taking the time. I know it's getting a little late for uh, Mitch and Paolo in particular, and, um, and we really appreciated their calling in for this. Um, and I think we'll adjourn now so the S2S task force now can have their call. Um, so thanks, everyone, for attending. Thanks again to the speakers, and uh, please check out our website uh, for, for informa more information about this webinar and future webinars as well. Thanks a lot, everybody. Talk to you later. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan.